the alien screams of agony pierced the sky as human warriors systematically slaughtered the once arrogant invaders limb by limb. It had begun as a peaceful 4th of July in 2062. 35-year-old former Navy SEAL James Johnson celebrated with his wife and sons at their Montana home. Then the enormous alien ships descended, blotting out the sun. Ugly grey aliens emerged in angular black armor, firing plasma weapons. They mercilessly gunned down fleeing men, women and children. James rushed his family to their bunker, grabbed his AR-15 and sprinted outside. Through his scope, James saw the carnage in town. He dropped three aliens with precise headshots before retreating from heavy return fire. Sheriff Mike Simmons radioed for help as he and his deputies fought the hundreds of seven-foot-tall invaders in a desperate firefight. Human weapons seemed useless against alien armor. Unless humanity fought back and triumphed here, Earth would fall and billions would be enslaved or exterminated under the aliens' ruthless onslaught. The fate of the human species hung in the balance. Back at NORAD, General Matthews slammed his fist on the console as news feeds showed city after city under brutal alien assault. The enormous view screens displayed scenes of utter devastation, burning skyscrapers, cratered streets, civilians running in terror as plasma blasts rained down. A comms officer called out, Sir, incoming transmission from the alien commander. The main screen flickered to the sneering face of Corvus. His black eyes radiated cruelty and arrogance. When he spoke, it was in flawless English. People of Earth, you are now subjects of the glorious Vorkarian Empire. Resist and you will be destroyed. Corvus smashed the camera with a contemptuous swipe of his armored fist. The feed went dark. Fury pulsed through the general's veins. He bellowed orders across the command center. Get me the president now. All forces to DEFCON 1. I want every base in the nation launching birds and mobilizing troops immediately. Let's take the fight to these alien bastards. Klaxons blared as NORAD burst into action. From California to Florida, fighter jets roared down runways and scorched into the embattled skies. Soldiers piled into transports, rushing to the front lines. Off the Atlantic coast, a squadron of Navy F-35s banked hard to engage the oncoming Vorkarian fighters. The alien craft were angular, almost insectoid, and moved with unnatural agility. I've got tone yelled Lieutenant Riggs, the lead pilot. A missile leapt from his wing, corkscrewing toward the lead bogey, only to splash harmlessly against its shields. The Vorkarian fighters effortlessly evaded the human salvos. Their plasma cannons flashed, and F-35s burst into flames. Riggs barely had time to scream before his cockpit became an inferno. Trailing fire, the Navy jets spiralled into the churning waves below. The Vorkarians swooped through the carnage unscathed. In the battered streets of Los Angeles, a Marine platoon crouched behind the wrecks of burnt-out cars, trading shots with the hulking alien shock troops. The human rifles seemed pitifully inadequate against the enemy's armor. Private Alvarez cried out as a plasma blast took his arm off at the elbow. His squadmates dragged him back, but the aliens advanced relentlessly, shrugging off bullets and grenades. Overhead, Apache gunships dueled with sleek Vorkarian attack craft, autocannons chattering. The human pilots were skilled, but the alien ships ran rings around them. One by one, the Apaches exploded and plummeted into the burning cityscape below. On the command ship, Corvus watched the one-sided slaughter with cold satisfaction. These primitives were being crushed like insects. Soon this world would kneel before the Vorkarian Empire, or burn. James crouched behind the burnt-out husk of a pickup truck, his assault rifle pressed to his shoulder. Around him, a dozen men and women, veterans, hunters and brave civilians, took cover behind trees, boulders and the wrecks of destroyed vehicles. They were all that stood between the alien invaders and the defenseless families hiding in the mountains. A Vorkarian patrol marched down the road, their black armor glinting in the sun. James signaled to his team and they opened fire, bullets pinging off the aliens' shields. The Vorkarians returned fire with their plasma rifles, superheated bolts sizzling through the air. Aim for the joints, 
James yelled, putting his SEAL training to use. Their armor's weakest there. His fighters adjusted their aim and several aliens dropped, Ikor oozing from shattered limbs. The rest of the patrol fell back, taking cover behind their angular vehicles. James lobbed a grenade, the explosion engulfing an armored transport. It burst into flames, the aliens inside roasting alive. Fall back to the next position, James ordered as plasma shots filled the air. We'll hit them again in the canyon. The resistance fighters melted into the trees, leaving the patrol in disarray. Over the past week they had destroyed dozens of Vorkarian troops in daring ambushes like this. James's leadership had turned them into an effective fighting force, striking hard and fading away before the aliens could retaliate. But the Vorkarians were learning. As James and his men moved through the forest, a shadow fell over them. An alien dropship hovered above the trees, disgorging heavily armed shock troopers. James cursed and opened fire, downing several Vorkarians, but there were too many. Plasma bolts cut down his fighters, their screams echoing through the woods. Run, James bellowed, split up and head for the caves. A plasma shot hit him in the side, burning through his ballistic vest. James stumbled and fell, his vision going black. When he awoke, it was to the smell of smoke and death. The town was gone, reduced to a crater of molten glass by an orbital strike. In the distance, the Vorkarian ships hung in the sky, raining destruction on the world below. James struggled to his feet, clutching his rifle. He had to find the survivors, had to keep fighting. The mountains were their only refuge now. Far away, in the sterile labs of Area 51, Dr. Rosenberg stared at the comatose Vorkarian strapped to the examination table. It had taken a dozen taser hits and enough tranquilizer to put down an elephant, but they had finally subdued one of the aliens during the chaotic attack on the base. Now as he studied the readouts on the screens, Dr. Rosenberg felt a flicker of hope. The Vorkarian's DNA was shockingly similar to a human's, with only a few key differences. I have an idea, he said, turning to his exhausted team, but I'll need a volunteer. Herman Harris stepped forward, his young face determined. I'll do it, sir, whatever it takes. Dr. Rosenberg nodded grimly. We're going to create a virus, one that will target the Vorkarians but leave humans unharmed. But to do that, I need your blood and bone marrow. Harris swallowed hard but rolled up his sleeve. Let's get to work, then. As the medics began the extraction process, Dr. Rosenberg turned to the bank of computers. Gene splicing was still an imperfect science, but they were out of options. If this virus worked, it could turn the tide of the war. If it didn't, well, there wouldn't be a human race left to save. In Cheyenne Mountain, General Matthews watched the screens in horror as city after city fell to the aliens. The reports coming in from the front lines were grim. The Vorkarians outclassed them in every way, and the U.S. military was being pushed back on all fronts. "'Sir,' a comms officer called out, "'urgent message from Area 51. They say they, say they have a weapon, a virus that can kill the aliens.' Matthews felt a surge of desperate hope. "'Get me a secure line to Dr. Rosenberg, now!' He listened intently as the scientist explained his plan. It was a long shot, but it was the only chance they had. Do it, Matthews ordered. Deploy the virus as soon as it's ready. We'll hit them with everything we've got left. He turned to his staff, his face grim. This is our last stand, people. If this doesn't work, and it's been an honor serving with you all. As the command center burst into activity, Matthews closed his eyes for a moment, praying that this desperate gambit would succeed. The fate of the human race hung in the balance. Beneath the burning skies... A squadron of B-2 spirit bombers soared through the clouds, their sleek black forms nearly invisible against the night. In their bellies, they carried the last hope for humanity, cruise missiles loaded with the lethal anti-Vorkarian virus. At NORAD, General Matthews watched the operation unfold on the big screen, his face tense. Initiate global strike on my mark, he ordered. Three, two, one, mark. Across the world, Missiles roared from the bombers, arcing down toward the alien ships and troop concentrations. They detonated in blinding flashes, 
each one dispersing billions of engineered viral particles into the air. The microscopic killers infiltrated the Vorkarian ships through ventilation systems and environmental controls, flooding the recycled atmosphere. They drifted down from the sky and coated the hulking alien soldiers on the ground. At first, nothing seemed to happen. Then in ones and twos, the Vorkarians began to falter. On the bridge of the command ship, Corvus staggered as a sudden fever racked his body. He watched in disbelief as his crew slumped over their consoles, dark blood leaking from their eyes and mouths. What? What is happening? He rasped, his vision blurring. The display showed his ships losing power, spiraling out of control. Escape pods exploded in mid-air as the virus ravaged the helpless aliens inside. On the ground, Vorkarian infantry collapsed, their weapons clattering to the blood-soaked earth. They writhed in agony, their organs liquefying inside their armor. No amount of advanced technology could save them from the merciless onslaught of the virus. In the mountains of Montana, James and his band of survivors watched in amazement as the alien soldiers crumpled before their eyes. They emerged from their hiding places, picking their way through the bodies. Some Vorkarians still clung to life. James and his men captured them, stripping away their weapons and armor. Others, too far gone, were dispatched with grim efficiency. Mercy was a luxury they could no longer afford. At Area 51, Dr. Rosenberg pumped his fist in triumph as the reports flooded in. The Vorkarian forces were in full retreat, their ships crashing and burning across the globe. It had worked. The virus had saved humanity from extinction. But his elation was short-lived. An urgent notification flashed on his screen, a message from the medical isolation ward. With growing dread, he opened the video link. On the screen, Jack Harris convulsed on a hospital bed, his skin pale and slick with sweat. Blood leaked from his eyes and nose, staining the white sheets crimson. Doc, he choked out, his voice a painful rasp. The virus w is mutating and attacking human cells now, too. Dr. Rosenberg watched in horror as the young airman flatlined, his body finally giving out. He frantically scanned the medical data, his stomach twisting as the terrible realization set in. The virus had jumped species. It was adapting, evolving to infect human hosts. In a cruel twist of fate, the weapon that had saved them from the Vorkarians now threatened to wipe out humanity itself. A cold voice interrupted his racing thoughts. On another screen, a Vorkarian prisoner stared at him, its black eyes glittering with a mix of fear and cunning. We know what has happened, human, it said in perfect English. We have monitored your communications. Your weapon is now killing your own kind. Dr. Rosenberg clenched his fists, his mind whirling. The Vorkarian leaned closer to the camera, its voice dropping to a whisper. You have a choice. Give us the cure and we will leave your world in peace. Refuse and both our species will perish. The clock is ticking, Doctor. What will you do? Dr. Rosenberg worked feverishly in his lab, his hands shaking as he prepared another batch of experimental vaccine. The virus had already claimed millions of lives and brought the world to its knees. Governments had resorted to martial law, but even that was failing as panic consumed the populace. Rosenberg's eyes burned from exhaustion. He had not slept in days. Every time he closed his eyes he saw the faces of the dying pleading for salvation. And Jack... Brave, young Jack, the first human casualty of this mutated hell. Rosenberg would not let his sacrifice be in vain. Colonel James Johnson crouched behind the twisted wreckage of a Vorkarian dropship, his rifle at the ready. His team had infiltrated the crash site in the hopes of recovering any technology or data that could aid in the creation of a cure. James signaled to his men to move forward. They advanced cautiously, scanning for any sign of movement. The ship's hull gaped open like a wound, exposing its dark interior. Suddenly, a searing beam of plasma lanced out from the shadows, vaporizing Private Hernandez where he stood. James cursed and dove for cover as more shots followed, the ship's automated defences still active. Suppressing fire, he yelled, unleashing a hail of bullets at the ship. 
His men followed suit, their muzzle flashes lighting up the gloom. Under the cover of the barrage, Sergeant Wilkins sprinted forward and hurled a grenade through the breach. The explosion shook the ship, and the plasma fire ceased. James and his team moved in, picking their way through the smoke and debris. They found the ship's data core miraculously intact. James ripped it free, tucking it into his pack. But the victory was short-lived. As they made their way back out, a secondary explosion tore through the ship. Shrapnel scythed through the air and screams of agony filled James's ears. When the dust settled, half his men lay dead or dying. With a heavy heart, James gathered the survivors and the precious data core. The cost had been high, but if this could help create a cure, then perhaps their sacrifices would not be in vain. Back at the lab, Dr. Rosenberg pored over the new data, his face lit by the glow of the screens. The Vorkarian medical technology was beyond anything he had ever seen. Combined with his own research, he believed he could synthesize an effective vaccine. But it would take weeks to mass-produce and distribute, time they did not have. General Matthews stood before the viewscreen, his face lined with grief and exhaustion. The Vokarian commander, Corvus, stared back at him, his black eyes inscrutable. "'You have seen the devastation your virus has wrought,' Corvus said, his voice cold and unyielding. "'Your species teeters on the brink of extinction. But we can save you.' Matthews clenched his fists, his heart heavy with the weight of what he must do. "'What are your terms?' Half of your planet. Surrender it to us and we will provide the cure. Resist and you will perish. Matthews closed his eyes. The thought of ceding half the earth to these invaders was sickening. But what choice did he have? I, I will need to consult with the other world leaders, but I believe we have no alternative. We accept your terms. Corvus bared his teeth in a predatory smile. A wise choice, General. The cure will be delivered shortly. Prepare your people for the transition. The screen went blank. Matthew sagged in his chair, feeling like he had just signed humanity's death warrant, but at least they would survive. For now. The cure was distributed worldwide with breathtaking speed. Vorkarian ships unloaded vast quantities of the life-saving serum, which was rushed to hospitals and clinics in every nation. Slowly, agonizingly, the tide of death began to recede. But even as humanity celebrated its salvation, the Vorkarians were already moving in. Millions of humans were forced to evacuate the designated territories, leaving their homes and livelihoods behind as alien troops herded them away. Those who resisted were met with swift and brutal retribution. James watched the columns of refugees streaming past, their faces hollow with despair. The sight tore at his soul. He had fought so hard, sacrificed so much. And for what? To see his world divided and conquered? He looked down at the medal in his hand, awarded to him for his heroic actions in retrieving the Vorkarian data. It felt like a mockery now. What good were medals when his planet lay in chains? With a heavy sigh, James packed up his belongings and prepared to head home. His wife and son were waiting for him, ready to start a new life in the small slice of earth still under human control. But as he stepped out into the night, James paused and looked up at the stars. Somewhere up there, the Vorkarian ships hung in orbit, watching over their new dominion. This was not over, he vowed silently. One day humanity would rise again, one day they would reclaim what was theirs. The war had only just begun. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.